It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lewis Viteta. Lewis is Director of Medical Research at MedLab Clinical and Professor with the University of Sydney in Sydney Medical School. Between 2007 and 2013, he was the Director and Professor at the Centre for Integrative Clinical and Molecular Medicine at the University of Queensland School of Medicine in Brisbane. Lewis has research interests in the microbiome, nutrition, probiotics and immune function area, as well as research on cannabis medicines. Over to you, Lewis. Um, good evening, and uh, Evni, thank you for inviting me. Christine, thank you for inviting me to come and, uh, and talk to you very briefly about what the microbiome and some of the research that we do. Um, I, I, I love coming to, uh, to, to, to Melbourne from Sydney. Uh, uh, I, I, we left Melbourne in 2007, and it, it looked something like this. <laughs> and then I went up to Brisbane, and it looked something like that. <laughs> and now I'm in Sydney, and it looks something like this. <laughs> and, uh, things keep following me around. Um, so, okay, so, uh, you know, what, what's, it's very, very simple to talk about the microbiome, and yet, yet it's also very, very difficult uh, because, you know, have you ever felt that you've got butterflies in your tummy and, and you feel nervous about presenting to someone? Uh, not in this audience, I think I'm very much at ease, but when I present to my colleagues at the university or overseas, wherever I go, it, it can become nerve-wracking, and particularly if you talk about things that they don't agree with. And, and so, there, you know, you, you feel the, the, the gut feelings, whether it be good or bad, and it's very much, uh, I guess, that interaction that actually brings it home to me that there is a connection between the gut and the brain. And it's a very significant one because today we have a lot of research in this particular area uh, that gives us an idea about the, 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 the very amazing intestines and some of the gut-brain connections and the stress in the gut that we are going to uh, briefly discuss this evening. Now, uh, personality is also involved in this particular aspect of uh, gut-brain function as well as uh, research and other interesting things that we do in my lab uh, in Sydney. And, and I think that one of the things that we really, and there's going to be a little bit of physiology, just a little bit of biochemistry, I don't want to kill anybody off with this kind of stuff, that the, there is a language translation between the intestines, the bacteria and the brain, and this is, uh, uh, I, I guess, designated by the immune and hormonal systems that have this bi-directional flow of information between the gut and the brain that leads to an, an equ a state of equilibrium because uh, in maintaining equilibrium, we are in health. And when this equilibrium is off, uh, uh, chronic diseases may then ensue. So, uh, so what is the wonder of the intestines? Well, it, it contains uh, uh, approximately one and a half to two kilos of bacteria. And in terms of the mass, it contains trillions of cells. We've known for a, a long time uh, from the research articles that there is a ratio of 10 bacteria to one human cell. I think that that's uh, a mistake. It's more a one-to-one -one ratio. And, and as that, we are not all bacteria. Uh, an interesting note does uh, occur from the research in, in that in, in some individuals who have a very high fibre diet, the bulk of faecal matter is made up not of the fibre but actually of dead bacteria because we are recirculating our bacteria on a daily basis. And the gut consequently sometimes is referred to a forgotten organ because it is an organ to itself. Uh, when I began doing this kind of research with Avni in the early 80s, uh, the gut was thought of as a collection of toxic waste and pathogenic bacteria. What we know today is that it's totally untrue. What we know today is that the, 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 the trigger, the genesis of chronic diseases certainly does begin in the gut and the aberrant actions that certain bacteria uh, carry out in the gut. There are no good or bad bacteria. There's just bacteria. The ones that, 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 that tolerate the host and the ones that don't tolerate the host. And, uh, and if you are, a, um, a, uh, I guess, a supporter of probiotics, well, then that's a good thing, I guess, because they are an adjunctive medicine. They're not a supplement. Anybody that takes probiotics 
ad libitum and goes and buys them from a, a, a supermarket shelf, I think you're doing the wrong thing. You actually need to be talking to somebody about these formulations because they are not a panacea to fix everything. And if you were to inject the lactobacillus acidophilus that does a lot of good things to the immune function of the gut into the systemic circulation, you're going to get a very nice surprise of a, of a septicemia of some sort. So we need to really understand what goes on with these kind of things. Uh, P stands for pathobiont. Uh, these are bacteria that have got the capacity to become a pathogen and produce disease. And the commensals are those bacteria that actually tolerate the host and coexist with the host producing metabolites that keep the host healthy and keep the bacteria healthy. There, there are a number of functions that the gut bacteria produce, uh, then not of the gut, but in the gut. And, and in terms of helping the body to digest certain this is very, very clear. They help with the production of some vitamins. They also help control possible infections from other microorganisms, such as uh, Clostridium perfringens or, 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 or other types Klebsiella is Klebsiella pneumonia or Klebsiella oxytoca, which can have a lot of pathogenic activity. And they then also provide important functions in the immune system. Actually helping the immune system to do a particular job, especially in early life, to maintain immunological tolerance. And when we look at, um, at, at the overall view as to what goes on pre-birth as well as post-birth, we now know that the... The, 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 the microbiome of the baby begins its maturation in utero around the second to third trimester of pregnancy, whereby now the mother's oral microbiome is finding its way to the baby and initiating what, is, what we understand to be immunological and metabolic tolerance so that by the time that this newborn reaches the age of about three or four years of age, it has now got in its intestine a microbiome profile that is similar to that of an adult. So we need to be looking at the gut microbiota of the mother, uh, vaginal infections, these are maternal factors that can actually lead to uh, premature birth, uh, periodontitis, in other words, uh, infections in the mouth that then can be translated to the baby and putting the baby at risk for reducing its, uh, its, uh, its trigger to reach immunological tolerance and putting that baby possibly at risk for developing something the untoward once it's born. Uh, at birth, we have, uh, we have uh, a number of studies that talk about vaginal delivery versus cesarean delivery, and there is a significant difference in the type of bacteria that colonize the newborn. It, it's important to really understand the use of antibiotics and breastfeeding and host genetics and the environment as postnatal factors that will influence how this new individual develops with respect to achieving immunological tolerance and metabolic tolerance. If there is a clinician today that is prescribing an antibiotic and doesn't co-prescribe a probiotic uh, to actually maintain uh, immunological tolerance, that individual is just not caring about the evidence. We have so much evidence today that we need to be, uh, uh, for, for a, an antibiotic prescription, needs to be followed with a probiotic for the duration of the period of the, anti, of the course of the, anti, the antibiotic. W why? Why are we doing this? There's nothing magical. Pa uh, probiotics is not a panacea to fix everything, but it is an important adjunctive medicine to protect keystone species. And keystone species around the first three years of life is critically important in order to keep at bay the development later of obesity or chronic diseases associated with obesity or any of the autoimmune diseases. If you have a look at the last 50 years, uh, medicine has done a very nice job in reducing some very significant and dangerous infections. Um, uh, but in that same 50-year period, we've got autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's disease, asthma, multiple sclerosis doing this. And this is basically, for me, a lack of early life infectivity, which is actually playing havoc with this new individual's immune system. So what we really need to really understand that we cannot deplete the microbiota of the child, in particularly the assault of all mucosal surfaces, including the skin that happens at birth, uh, with bifida and lactobacillus bacteria, breastfeeding is, uh, is crucial. Uh, certain other types of cretin ciliaceae that are associated with host genetics in order to maintain metabolism. 
and the familial transmission and environmental exposures that then put this individual either at risk or actually protecting this individual for uh, achieving immunological tolerance in later life. And certainly what we really do need to understand is that when a baby goes from this scenario uh, and, and, and is trying to achieve immunological metabolic maturation and moves into this scenario, albeit a little bit less aggressive, um, you then have a, an individual that is now at a very low risk of developing a chronic disease in later life. Now, if we look at this very old graph uh, published by the Japanese in, back in 1978 when I was, I was still a student, uh, and the changes of faecal bacteria with age, you can actually see that at birth there are these facultative, um, uh, facultative anaerobes uh, that, that make their way into the, into the gut of the, of the child. And as, and as the child progresses in age, we now have obligate anaerobes <coughs> and bacteroides, eubacteria, and aerobic streptococci that are actually now forming that two, one and a half, two kilogram mass that is now leading to immunological tolerance. But what's very, very interesting is that in the adult, the bifidobacteria tend to decrease as we age. And recent studies from Europe have shown that as bifidobacteria decrease in older age groups, so does our mucosal immunity fail. And we see in clinical practice those elderly individuals that don't have a chronic disease usually succumb to some sort of chest infection uh, uh, that becomes a pneumonia and then they end up succumbing to that. And this is basically a failure of the immune system. And bifidobacteria have been shown in my lab and in other labs that to interacts significantly with mucosal, uh, the mucosal immune system that then translates that message to the cell-mediated immune system to maintain mucosal cell-mediated equilibrium throughout life. The studies from Europe show, and particularly in Italy, shows that the elderly, the centenarians and supercentenarians, have very high concentrations of bifidobacteria in the fecal, in the fecal matter, as compared to those that live 70 to 80, 85 years of age, which have very low concentrations of bifidobacteria. It's, it's, it's interesting studies. Uh, it, it requires more and more, um, more research, but it's very interesting to pay attention to some of these things that we can actually fix today uh, in, in, in the evolution of medicine. And when you look at electron micrographs of breastfed infants, they're loaded with bifidobacteria. And this makes a hell of a lot of sense in early childhood because these are stimulating the immune system to develop in a, in a child. Whereas in the elderly, in adults, there's a whole mixture of bacteria, very low in bifidobacteria, that then tends to put the, this individual at a disadvantage for uh, developing proper immune function or maintaining an immune function. It's interesting to see that kids <laughs> uh, get their bacteria from everywhere. Avni, I think that this kid's going to be a gastroenterologist one day. And, and, in terms of, uh, and in terms of understanding our, the bacteria and their relationship with food, we actually see that we now imagine that your favourite meal, uh, you, you, and if you can see it really in detail, uh, you imagine the colour and the smell. It's this very thought of eating your favourite food can actually release the stomach juices before it gets, it gets there. And this kind of connection can actually go both ways and, and a troubled intestine can actually send signals to the brain that are adverse, that are associated with anxiety and depression. And therefore, a person's gut or intestinal distress can be the cause or the product of stress, anxiety and depression that becomes exacerbated, even though with some very good food. So we now can actually build a picture between the brain and the gut in terms of altered levels of inflammatory cells and, and or other signaling molecules that interact with the intestinal epithelial cell in something that is known as dysbiosis. And what, the, what these big words mean is that we have a single layer of intestinal cells that separates a whole bunch of bacteria from the mucosa in the gut and the immune system in order to maintain a balance or not a balance. And when you alter behaviour with disease and emotion and cognition, these are the problems that one gets because of the adverse effects on the brain. Whereas when we have a balance in the gut, we have health. 
we have normal behaviour, normal emotions, cognition, and also uh, regulated thoughts. And this very much speaks very loudly that we have a brain to gut connection that is very, very significant. And there is a lot of research associated with this in terms of mood and gut feelings, gut microbes and the brain. There is a paradigm shift in neuroscience from a whole heap of uh, very prestigious journals that talk about this kind of connection because we, what we have is systemic circulation communication through the, the systemic circulation, but we also have neuronal communication via the vagal and sympathetic system of nerves that connects the gut uh, the gut to the brain. And this is very, very interesting because there are therapies that challenge the intestinal microbes. Immune modulation, uh, biomarkers, intestinal microbes that we can modulate, the use of probiotics and the use of prebiotics. Now, I often get asked about probiotics because we do a lot of research with probiotics. And as I've said before, this is not a panacea to fix every chronic disease that you and I can, can discuss. But the formulations that have got evidence attached to them can be used for different individuals, whether they have type two, early type 2 diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, even improving mucositis in the intestines of patients undergoing chemo and or radiotherapy to reduce the mucositis and the diarrhea side effects, but also to improve neutropenia, the loss of white blood cells due to chemo and radiotherapy that actually helps protect one's life. Most patients undergoing chemo and or radiotherapy that suffer severe neutropenia tend to lose their life because of that. Not because of the cancer itself, but because of the treatment. So understanding what goes on in the gut with respect to how we change microbes transiently is very, very important because the administration of probiotics will not recolonize the gut. If in early life we lose keystone species, it's very difficult to actually get them back. And this is very, very important why we need to protect our young baby individuals from the moment that they're born and even in utero so that they reach and achieve immunological maturity and a metabolic maturity so that we can significantly reduce the risk of developing a chronic disease. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper where we put the, we didn't put the brain at the center of everything, we actually put the gut at the center of everything. And when we wrote this review, we actually talked about how the gut and the bacteria and the immune system that is here, 70% of it is in the gut, influences end organ physiology lungs, skin, skeletal muscle, kidney, adipose tissue, the heart, the liver, the brain, and in terms of how the science of probiotics, for me in, in particular, I guess, has proven that some of the health benefits exerted are effects on the immune system through several molecules that include uh, cell walls, uh, peptidoglycans that are associated with the bacteria that stimulate the immune system to create a response in favor of the host. And, uh, and, and, and other interactions specific to host cells and receptors that actually allow us to produce beneficial, a beneficial response. Now, stress. Stress is a major factor associated with health. Everybody's got health and everybody's got stress. Nobody in this room has no stress. If you work for a university, you're stressed. If you work for a biotech company like I do, you're stressed. If you lecture to students, you're stressed. If you've got a husband, you're stressed. If you've got a wife, you are definitely stressed. <laughs> if you've got a wife and a girlfriend, you feel you've got double the stress. If you, if you, and if you've got a wife and a boyfriend, I suggest that you make a decision and cut your, <laughs> cut your stress by half. And they, they've also, this, he also has stress because life produces that. No one has no stress. And in terms of understanding what stress is, it can particularly influence by stress in terms of gastrointestinal function, as I said earlier. All right? Common reported symptoms due to stress can include heartburn, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, all associated with shifts in the intestinal microbiome, slight shifts all right, that can be recovered by just recovering the stress not necessarily by being, uh, giving someone a multi-strain probiotic uh, as a panacea to fix all of this, because you can actually supplement someone uh, or administer probiotics, but if you don't get rid of the stress, 
it just continues. So uh, what I've learned from people that know more than me, like Avni Sali, is prudent nutritional practices, some nice physical activity throughout your life, some administration of supplements now and then, and then giving yourself a reward daily. And if you do that, you put medicine out of business, so to speak, because it's about maintaining health. You see, I don't know anyone that gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror and says, today's going to be a great day to have a heart attack or a stroke. No one wants any of that. All right? Everybody wants to stay healthy. But as I've been taught for over the years, nothing happens on this side of the table. It's on that side of the table. And if the patient's a willing participant, 70% of that's got to happen on the other side of the table. Uh, things happen because there are no miracle medicines, but there is a miracle where a patient actually does do the work. Uh, in, in animals such as rats, stress can be induced in terms of experimental stimulations and, and I think that there's a lot of those experiments that actually show that uh, you can actually induce stress in animals and actually measure biochemical markers to show how animals do become stressed and we can apply a lot of that uh, evidence to, to human studies so that we really understand what really is going on. Because when you look at the vagus nerve, it's the only cranial nerve that actually connects the brain to the intestine. 20% of the fibres are from the brain to the gut. 80% of the fibres are going the other way. And what we have is when you have an altered composition of the gut microbiota, there are different kinds of metabolites that release hormones, release uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that then lead to adverse reactions that go to the brain. And you know what they say about the vagus? What goes on in the vagus doesn't necessarily stay in the vagus. <laughs> so it's all being transported up into the head. And, and that with uh, stressful, uh, I, I guess, domains that happen on a daily basis tend to maintain uh, a, a dysbiotic gut that actually maintains an altered microbiota to an adverse shift that influences adversely immune function in the gut then translates to uh, a stress and emotional conditions that one can actually seems to not be able to get rid of them. So in terms, is there much of a mind-gut connection? Well, symptoms themselves can actually be stressful. And if these can't be uh, uh, resolved, stress itself can make any of those symptoms actually act much worse. And this is very, very important as we age because ageing is associated with significant stresses that changes the intestinal microbiome. You know, some of the research that I've been doing over the last 10 years, one of the major markers of ageing is the loss of skeletal muscle mass. The quicker you and I lose skeletal muscle mass, the quicker we have a foot in the grave. And if you don't have, uh, and, and you're losing somewhere between 5 and 10% of your skeletal muscle mass um, from a, per decade from the age of about 55 onwards. And the easiest way to keep this is to do some physical activity. You don't know, need to go and run a marathon, but you know, 10 or 15 minutes of walking and some 10 or 15 minutes of weight-bearing exercises and maintaining your gut health will actually help maintain skeletal muscle mass. And what happens in terms of metabolic muscle dysfunction, it consistently shown to be an important marker of aging and longevity. It is very much a harbinger of poor health outcomes. So if your skeletal muscle mass loss is significant, it's impinging on your gut microbiota and the loss of bifidobacteria that then translates to adverse in mucosal immunity, you've got your select triggers here that will actually make it almost impossible to survive uh, to, a, the, the, to, a, to a longer phenotype. It starts the catabolic breakdown of all connective tissue. The cascade of degeneration affects the whole body, including the brain. And that is where anxiety, depression comes into play. And immune dysfunction that is very much intestinal microbiome related tends to uh, be significantly associated with skeletal muscle mass loss, which averages that 5 to 10% per decade after the age of 55 years. It's interesting from our research perspective, some of the work that we've done, we've published a couple of papers in this area where we've looked at Orotate Uridine Connect. Now, you may not know what uridine is, but it's also one of the most important 
chemicals known to man. If you and I don't have uridine, we cannot make DNA, we cannot make RNA, we cannot make biomembranes, we cannot turn over tissue. We're turning over tissue every day. Skeletal muscle cells turn over once every 30 days. Skin cells turn over every day. Intestinal cells turn over every three to five days. So we're, we're continuously creating new tissue. And if you don't have uridine, this doesn't happen. And it in intimately links neurotransmitter and DNA turnover to the metabolic function of the brain and mood that relates it to the gut. The regulation of the nervous system, brain signaling compounds, a whole bunch of these, uh, fatty acid synthesis, glycogen and protein metabolism, all associated with uridine. And our discovery is that orotate is a principal precursor for making uridine. So can you just go and get some magnesium orotate, take it, and everything's going to be all right? Almost. That's almost the story. So what we found is, and this is where the biochemistry comes in, you don't, no one needs to remember all of this. Uh, there's the orotate, and here's your uridine metabolites that lead to DNA and RNA turnover. Our discovery is that in a test tube of blood, we find that a lot of uridine metabolites are inside the, the red blood cells. And that makes a lot of sense because the red blood cell crosses the blood-brain barrier and delivers you the uridine metabolites to the brain. And this is very, very significant for us because from an oral orotate intake, we find a ratio of four times more orotate uridine metabolites inside the red blood cells than what there is in the plasma. And that is very, very significant for our, for our studies because we are actually conducting at the moment a big phase 2A placebo control trial in Brisbane on a, a preparation that we call magnesium, uh, magnesium uh, orotate probiotic combination. The first study just looked at magnesium orotate in depressed individuals that had been on uh, an SSRI for about two years with no response. And what we found was that over a eight-week period, these patients were on a, on, on, a, on a depression score scale, had reached almost normality at week six. And by week eight, they were considered by an independent psychiatrist to be normal. And this is very, very interesting for us because we thought, well, we think we've got something here. But we wanted to address also the gut because shifts in the gut of patients that, uh, that have been diagnosed with depression have uh, been published all over the world and we find that there is a problem in the gut. So what we decided to formulate a preparation with probiotic bacteria and then run a second pilot study. And what we now find is that when we add the probiotics, the decrease in the depressive score happens much quicker at around four weeks and it's maintained normal and then when we stop the treatment, within about another uh, eight weeks, the patients are back to their normal depressed states. Quality of life is low. At eight weeks, it's high, and then it's back to low again. So it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, correlation because all of these patients in both of these pilot studies were major depressed patients on the medication with no effect for an average of two to two, to two, two and a half years. This has led us to the randomized placebo trial that we're running at the moment with about 180 patients. And we want to see how our adjunctive medicine that is now patented worldwide can actually fear, uh, uh, figure with respect to a placebo. And it, because the question, with these, um, the question with these, how do you know that this isn't a placebo effect? If you've ever seen a depressed patient, you shake hands with them, they feel better. But this is, a, this is a significant result. Uh, this is not just about a handshake. This is about a metabolic change in signaling pathways in the brain of patients that have been taking SSRIs for a couple of years and have no response to the depression sy sy uh, symptoms. So we will see probably by this time next year, we'll probably have these results. And I'd be very happy to come back and share this with you. OK, as a, as a postscript note, something that we've also been working on is the vermiform appendix. You all know about the appendix? This thing that everybody gets taught in medicine uh, that is uh, a worm-shaped organ, a vestige of evolutionary development. It has nothing to do with anything. Well, that's not true. 
because some characteristics present in humans, apes, rabbits, and rodents, they have appendices, and in a protected location in the most proximal part of the colon, relatively little contact with feces because of the location and its narrow worm-like lumen. This is very, very interesting because what we find, as well as others, it's that it's a safe house for re-inoculating the large bowel and also the terminal uh, ileum with bacteria that have been lost. It's, 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 it's an inoculum, a biofilm inoculum that re-inoculates the, uh, the large bell uh, following a dysentery of an effect where the diarrheal clearance of the large bell clears the bacteria. The vermiform appendix is protected because it seals itself off and once that dysentery effect, the diarrheal is, is abrogated, we re-inoculate the large bell with commensal bacteria and as such facilitates re-inoculation of the intestines post a GI infection. And this is very, very interesting because this is largely an immunological organ. This is a transverse section of, an appendix, of a normal appendix. Uh, the transverse section is like this, all right? And there's the lumen and you, we, we, we note certain areas, the submucosa, lymphoid follicles. It's a very rich immunological organ. And when we thought that it was, uh, it had nothing to do with anything, it was a huge mistake on our part because it actually contains the safe house of the bacteria, but it has a lot of immunological functions that relates it to mucosal immunity for the rest of the intestine. And in that way, we now see that the immune tissue, gut associated lymphoid tissue, is known to be concentrated in the appendix in several species and is considered as an, a very important immune organ. And although the functions of the GALT are poorly understood, it's clear that they are involved in the body's ability to recognize foreign antigens and, uh, and, and from, ingested from ingested material. And this is very, very important. Uh, the neonatal appendectomy impairs mucosal immunity in rabbits. Now, this is a clue for us to try and keep our appendix for as long as we can. And what we, these studies tend to show is that it supports a major role of the rabbit appendix in seeding the intestinal lamina propria, and that's the, 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 the part of the appendix, with plasma cell precursors. These are immune system cells, very, very important, that produce immunoglobulin A, and test animals had significantly lower immunoglobulin in the intestines, but not in the serum once the appendix had been removed. So the appendix is very important to maintain uh, immunological function. And when you immunize the animals, if you've got an, append uh, an appendix, you actually do much better than when you don't. So what is really going on? Mechanistically, it's the formation of a biofilm. Biofilms are present all over in nature. And we've got them also inside our intestines and inside the, 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 the appendix. It's a process of formation of bacteria that adhere to a surface, mucus uh, material, and the bacteria that then leads to the formation of this biofilm that keeps our bacterial safe house happy so that when we need it, we can call on it. So... There have been uh, some very nice publications over the last 10 years or so that show that uh, the, uh, the appendix has been reported to be well adapted to maintain biofilms containing a mutualistic intestinal microbiome, which is very, very important because it safe houses our keystone species. And due to the immune system maintaining microbial films in the mammalian intestines, in other words, the immune system talks to the bacteria in the biofilm maintaining homeostasis. What do you mean by that? Maintaining an equilibrium between pro and anti-inflammatory activity that is in favour of the host. And biofilms, as I said, are widely known to be safe zones for bacteria where there is protection from assault by a variety of factors, including other microbes, thus forming a, co a cooperative community. And this is very, very important. So, early studies from 1974, 1988, show that the bacterial populations reported very much look like the ones that we find today in, in a lot of our studies. And what we also have found from a UK study, it classifies that 80% of the participants with inflammatory problems with the appendix were positive for depressive symptoms. Psychological depressive symptoms continue post the removal of an appendix. In our clinical studies, we find that those 
patients that have been diagnosed with major depression where the SSRI is not working, the, the, the rate of appendix removal is about 35%. So three out of 10 patients in our series have had their appendix removed and have had multiple rounds of antibiotics in the last 12 months. And it could be a reason as to why the SSRIs don't work. So additional studies have shown uh, and much more recent studies from 2013 show that there are a whole, whole bunch of different types of bacterial populations that have been reported, determined that the human appendix contains a wealth of microbes, including members of 15 phyla. But look at this. The genera of bacteroides, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, were the most consistent and most concentrated. So those bacteria that we actually need to maintain our survival are housed in the, in the, in the appendix. Does that mean that if you don't have an appendix, you've had it? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it means that you need to be adhering to prudent dietary practices. And that at times, if you are being prescribed an antibiotic, that you certainly do need a multi-strain probiotic. And you better get a good one because they're not all the same. Some of them are just absolute rubbish. So. Is in summary, the physiological to psychological connect, brain to gut. It's very, very clear in the 21st century. What we do see is that the axis has a number of commensals and pathobionts that are in equilibrium to maintain immunological function. But all of these factors play a role in maintaining the brain in equilibrium so that we don't suffer continuous uh, uh, anxiety and, um, and depressive disorders. And, uh, and, and, if, and if you don't want to do any of that, you get one, yourself one of these. Uh, this is a very natural antidepressant for all mood disorders. Um, I love this animal. It's my daughter's animal. But you know, every time I see it, I get, I get very happy. I thank you for your attention. Uh, the research that I do uh, does not just happen by myself. It happens uh, with a whole bunch of people that I work with. Uh, Nothing that I do happens uh, you know, singularly. I'm very grateful for Avni and a couple of other people that have been my mentors throughout my career. Uh, they, the, these are the people that taught me to think laterally. And, and I'm always grateful to them and I'm grateful to Avni and a couple of others that have passed away. And with that, I thank you.